Welcome to Amsterdam and KubeCon Cloud Native Con 2023. Join John Furrier, Savannah Peterson, Rob Streche, and U. P. Scott as the Cube covers the largest conference on Kubernetes, cloud native, and open source technologies together with developers, engineers, and IT leaders from around the globe. Live coverage of KubeCon Cloud Native Con 2023 is made possible by the support of Red Hat, the CNCF, and its ecosystem partners. Welcome back everyone. This is theCUBE's live coverage of KubeCon and Cloud Native Con Europe. It's like open source TV here. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. We got Ray Stretcher here with theCUBE analyst. Of course, theCUBE alumni back again, Richard Hartman, the director of community at Grafana Labs, a legend. We're just talking about open source TV. I feel like whenever you come on, we get an update on open source. Great to see you again, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. So we were just talking before we came on camera, the dynamics of open source projects. Yesterday we were talking about AI, you had some great insights around the impact of licensing, you've done some research on this. A lot of good stuff's happening, new numbers are coming out, 60% new users here at KubeCon, new blood coming in, projects are doing great. How are you doing? Busy, <laughs> but good, <laughs> it's a blast. <laughs> okay, let's go first into the, uh, I want to get to the whole open source ecosystem and you know, some of the dynamics there, but first, I think really an important story we're seeing, and it's kind of related to open source, it's kind of on the fringe, we're bringing it in for conversation to start looking at a impact of AI. Obviously Stack Overflow is just banned chat GPT, because they don't want to have flooded with auto answers, you're seeing a lot of licensing issues. You've been researching this, and there are some implications around AI, auto coding, we were calling it code pollution. That's my word, a little bit over the top, but you know, it makes the point. Right. You know, if you're going to flood code, it's not good, it's only going to clog things up. I, I agree on the pollution aspect, or at least for the, of, the, of the potential for pollution. The, the thing is, and I'm, I'm not a lawyer, but I, I, like, I like reading legal text for weird reasons. Um, at least under US law, as we currently, our best guess, or as the current uh, state of the of the law is, you cannot copyright automatically generated things, right. or the written word which is automatically generated. So you can't really put a lot of protection on this, but what can absolutely happen is that something which has been generated automatically can be under copyright. Of course, those large language models which are underlying those code generation, they are actually based on code. And like, take an Apache 2 license project, and you feed something which comes from GPL or AGPL in there, those are not actually compatible licenses. Or, I mean, they are, but not for the intents and purposes of the people who want to keep using Apache 2. And that is, is a risk. Because if you, if you slide something in, knowingly or unknowingly, and then someone comes around and is like, okay, this is actually licensed on a different license, you have a yeah. problem. And even if it's just Apache 2 which is being copied from, you still might have requirements on, on naming the origin authors, retaining copyright headers, things like these. And as of today, there is nothing which actually does all of this and actually checks all of this and gives you, these are my references, yeah. where I learned from and where I pulled from. As such, put them in an appendix or whatever. And also licenses are not made for this, because I, I don't want to have a header which is this large. So maybe at some point we come to a, to a system where I don't know, I, I have a reference file, and from that reference file, I, I pull in where this was coming from, so I still give some sort of attribution and, and reflect this in the licensing requirements instead of, of having a header, again, of, of like this size. Yeah. yeah, and Rob, you know, we've been, you know, we've seen the ways of innovation, and every single time there's an inflection point, there's always a licensing dynamic. I'll go back, I'm kind of old now, so we're all kind of uh, been around the block a few times, but I remember when you, know, you go back to the um, you know, late 90s, early 2000s, when um, open source was booming, if you were a founder, you kind of didn't know what dual source and Apache and GPL was, and you had those rules of the road for open source, but you build something and then someone wants to say buy the company, and you have to pay all the lawyers. <laughs> it's like, wait a minute, you, you use code from the MIT license right. in here, and it would unwind innovation. Yeah. Okay, and here we have this new dynamic. And I, I think, I, I, I had the same worries about copyright and what happens when copyrighted. Uh, I was recently at a company where we have our Apache 2 and then we created a community license. So if that community licensed software were to, and which was out there showed up in ChatGTP, it could impact somebody who was using that differently mm. from our Apache 2. Yes. And I, I think that becomes a very, you know, brings up what we were talking about, which is that 
the humans may not be generating all the code, but they're going to have to be smart enough to actually go through the code and understand where did it come from. And I, I, I think, do you see, I, that I like the whole reference file type of concept, and I think that's completely missing from all of the generative AI that's out there now. Do you see that uh, more being private versions, like with, within Grafana starts to use your version of an LLM or something like that to help you, or how do, how do you see that working? That's actually something which, um, which is something which is being discussed. I, honestly, I don't think we're the only company having no, those yeah. kind of thoughts where we say, okay, we know where we have complete permission to do everything with the code, and as such, we can be training on it. But that is, is also a problem, because when you look at large language models, and like all of those players make huge noise about how, how, they, um, how they make, um, what was it, the, um, I forgot the term, but like the smaller data sets which you, which you actually use to fi uh, fine tuning data sets. Right. They yeah. make those public and they make huge noise about, it. oh, it's open source and everything, which is not the truth. Yeah. If you talk to the experts in the field, the actual thing which matters is the much larger body of work on which the initial training was done. Exactly. And this is also part of, or this is actually where, where most of the, where the substance is coming from, and the fine tuning is where basically the errors are, are being weeded out and, and optimizations are made so you have less wrong answers and everything. So um, you need a substantial amount of data to train on, and that is something which is non-trivial. Yeah. Unless you're like one I of mean, the hyperscalers, you don't yeah. have this amount of code. And just for the people watching, that the S-bomb is being discussed in terms yeah. of supply chain. How, can, how do you figure out what's in that base? It's so massive. Yes. There has to be copyright yeah. in there, and then it's in the public domain at this point. So what you're saying is that the generating code is essentially public domain by default, or no. not, or, or not licensed. No, so public domain would be, I can do whatever I want. And that is the inverse. Okay. I don't know what I can even do with it. That's right. That's, that's much, much worse, because yeah, I, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. This is my point about back in the day when you had to go to the lawyer saying, okay, you got to rewrite code because you can't use that if you're going to sell the company or do a licensing deal. Well, let's talk about case law. So right now, there's really no precedent. What you, what's somewhere? your opinion about that? There will be case law. <laughs> <laughs> Who's going to be first? <laughs> uh, I yeah. have a bet, but I'll share it over a beer. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we've heard rumblings in the hallway here that people here that are exhibiting have gone on and put stuff into ChatGPT. We know the Samsung example we've been talking yeah. about on theCUBE where they actually had proprietary code go out into ChatGPT. We've heard customer lists, people writing memos, internal things. Hey, rewrite my, my internal all hands meeting. Yeah. I mean, that's out there now. It, this is it, the danger. It very much is, and even if I don't have to write as per corporate agreement, licensing, whatever, to put this in there, it's still in there. And at least as per the licensing agreement with, for example, ChatGPT, they can use all of this to train their model. Right. So they literally have the right to, to go through all of this data, all of this, all of this sometimes very, very valuable data in theory and just get stuff out which they want. And in the end, like, if I do this, I'm the person in the middle because I didn't have the right to, uh, to do this, but I still gave someone else that data under a license agreement or under a usage agreement where I gave them permission mm -hmm. to do this. So anything happens, I sit in the middle yeah. and I get, basically I'm the one who, who gets it from both sides. Let, let me ask you guys both a question because I think this is a great conversation because we're riffing in real time here about an unknown future. Well, you can draw on the past maybe here in open source, because what we're really talking about here is a, a whole nother level of new open source, not yet known licensed backlash or blowback. So if things are going to become more open with data, what might happen? What do you think the scenario is? Does it get shut down? Do people go to their corners and become more fragmented? Because the scenarios are interesting here. What, there's a lot of what could happen based on what that bit, next bit flips. So if we go, okay, let's see who gets sued first and set precedent law, there'll be some breakage, but move fast, progress, or do we just stop everything? What do you guys see as a potential future? Richard, we'll start with you. So, I think the cat is out of the bag. There is no way to put this genie back in. It's, it's, going, it's around to stay, and we are also going to see a lot of really, really good usage, but we are also going to see problems. I, I like the concept of co-pollution, because if you, if you want to build a, 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 a detector for uh, any, any radiation today, 
and you need a steel enclosure, the only way to get steel, which is not contaminated by above ground atomic tests, is to go back to, to ships which have sunk before we started using atomic bombs. Well, using is maybe the wrong term, but <laughs> you, you, get my, yeah. you get my meaning. There's no pure steel. Because you need to blow so much air into, into your iron during the steel cooking process, you just contaminate with the residues of what's still in the air. So the only way, again, is to, to, to send divers, cut up old ships, and then get that steel out. And we, we have the same inflection point for mm -hmm. humanity's library of Alexandria on the internet. Yeah. There anything after middle of last year, there is some, some, some taint to it. We cannot be as certain that this has not just been fully automatically generated mm -hmm. and is void of any actual substance or, or any human comprehension and just basically a stochastic parrot parroting back th stuff which someone else wrote. So they point. strip mine, uh, chat GPT open air, they strip mine the web. I mean. Essentially. But they, I yeah. would be surprised if you And get they're charging for it. That's unethical. <laughs> the web was free. I, or free, f I'm uh, saying that's, that's my <laughs> hyperbole. That's my hyperbole. No, no, yeah. But it's all serious. They, the, they're getting the data, reformatting it. So I, since they're blowing air into it. it. At least a, a part of it where they've trained their model. And I, I think that's, that's yeah. the, the, I think when I, what I'm very interested in is I, I think that the technology has so much promise for certain things. I think you know, where Grafana plays in particular in anomaly detection and looking at an analytics and looking for things inside mm -hmm. there that some of the analysts can't see or can't mm -hmm. think to see. Uh, I also think I'm, I'm a big fan of the prompt being able to ask questions, very you know, search oriented, but more natural language. And I, I think it has advantages bringing newer people into certain parts of the industry like security as well. Um, but I think it's going to be private data that it, those models are trained on. So, because I also think that people's applications and their deployments of things like Kubernetes and the apps that they build on top are kind of snowflakes unto themselves in many cases. Yes, but also there's a very, very, or there's actually two very different or very important points here. So. First, um, generally speaking, all of those models, whatever they are, they tend to be relatively good at giving you a bouquet of possible answers, yeah. and then you as a human choose. Like when you look at stable diffusion and something, you get a, a lot of pictures which are worthless, yeah. and you get a few which are kind of nice, and you can yeah. iterate on this, and you can improve on this, and at the end you select one of them. That's very much different from um, where, I, where I have, so I have a very wide, valid answer space of, of my question or for my question. If I, if I ask, write me code which determines from those x-rays if that person has cancer, there is a very, very constrained space for correct answers. Right. And people are completely conflating the two. So when you say explain this function to me and I think about it, that is a super valid use of this technology. When you say write me that thing, that's maybe not the best. And we, we had someone who interviewed at, at Grafana and they were using all of the all of the AI for the coding interview. And we let them, because like it, bring the tools you can use and yeah. create show, see what yeah. they got. And they tied themselves into a knot and they <laughs> what didn't happened? make yeah, well, the, what they, was the what was the code like? What was the assessment? I, I wasn't part of the oh, okay. thing, I just heard the story. It, it, <laughs> it didn't go, go too well. <laughs> well, um, this comes back down to what I call the crutch factor. If you're leaning on AI too much, yeah. Yeah, and not augmenting the, the, the brain, it's going to yes. cause a lot of people, younger coders, this is back to my, yeah. them not being aware of the new licensing dynamics. Just like on our generation, we were kind of feeling our way through the, the, the new licenses that were more, you know, derivative works friendly, some contribute back to the community. So all those things were happening just to keep the rising tide going. So we're now at that new inflection point. How do we manage it? What, what's a use case? What's a possible scenario for an outcome that could be good? I mean, there are lots of things which are good. Like for example, I've seen things where, where people who, who maybe don't have the best uh, expression, but still need to buy, write business letters or complaints to authorities or something, can put basically the, the basics of what they want to achieve in and they get a nicely structured letter which yeah. basically passes the sniff test of a professional that this is also a professional person. Because this is some form of gatekeeping. Yeah. Like, depending on your background and everything, maybe maybe you're just not as, as well versed in all of this and you're being gatekeeped based on this. So 
assistive technologies or automated captioning or yeah. image descriptions on social media and such, where a lot of people don't take the time to actually... Yeah, undifferentiated heavy lifting. Yes. Or yes. augmentation. And support of the humans, yeah. Yeah. not replacement of the humans. Yes. Those are really great examples and really great applications of this technology. Awesome. Well, great, we, we beat that dead horse there. Uh, AI is going <laughs> to, we don't know, it's like a weather <laughs> storm coming in. They don't know what's going to happen until it happens, but we do know data will be involved. Uh, open issues, like open source issues will be there, licensing issues, productivity issues, and potentially backlash on either code pollution, security. It's going to be, it's going to be crazy. Uh, final point here, I want to get in, close with a real quick KubeCon update. Richard, from your perspective, how do we feel about KubeCon this year? 60% new blood coming in, first timers, roughly 20% two, three years in, and folks like us, like 15%, make up the rest. What's your, what's your summary of KubeCon this year? What's your assessment? So, initially this was planned for, or anticipated for roughly 5K people, and we are at 10,500, um, so more than double in app capacity, which, which is, I think, a little bit the theme of, of, of this KubeCon. We weren't certain if, if this would be a good KubeCon, if, if people would be coming back or not. It, it really was very uncertain, to be honest. And in particular, in the last few months, there was an absolute flood of people who, who still wanted in. So I think we are, we are, we are basically back. I mean... Yeah, a steady state. We're yeah. back to steady state and growing. Yes. Well, just for clarification, I know it was announced on the keynote that they said that this was the largest <laughs> open source project. I know you're just laughing, but I want to clarify for the record. And CNCF has, has also acknowledged this on Twitter, but FOSDAM 23 in Brussels had more, is the, is the largest we, open we source. Don't know is about that 20, accurate? We don't know about 23. Um, the, so we don't, we don't have tickets or anything for FOSDAM, so I, I, we don't really, we don't have hard numbers but we can count people, how many are in the room, we can see how many MAC addresses do we have before there were privacy extensions, which kind of dates, dates this information for anyone who, who, who is maybe in the networking scene. Um, like how many, how many users did the access controllers see on their, uh, on, their, on their access points, and all of those things, and then basically correlate this with how full were the rooms, how many people were uh, on the hallway, blah, blah, blah. And that's where we have this number of, of roughly 12K from, that's a few years old. Yeah. Um, and you feel comfortable that's an accurate number? I am pretty confident, yes. Got it. Okay, so for the record, FOSDEM is the largest open source conference. In Europe, but in I Europe. also expect to be overtaken by Chris in, um, Chris Anicek, or if I wear the governing board hat maybe by myself in, um, <laughs> it's okay. in 2023 in Paris. <laughs> it's a rising tide, it's good for everybody. Oh yeah, it yeah. absolutely well, is. Yeah, it's, it's just all tongue in cheek inside, inside open source baseball it, and so it's all fun yes. to talk about. Uh, honestly, both Chris and I are a little bit OCD and when he was on stage, I'm like, no. nope. <laughs> 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 and, yeah. Well, it, congratulations. It's good fun. It's great to have you on, you're a legend, you got the data and I love your perspective. I love how we have this open source kind of concept going. We love, we'll, Continue to do open source TV as much as we can. Uh, Rob Stretchy and I and the Savannah and the team, thanks for coming on, appreciate it. Okay, that's a wrap up of this segment. Come back, we got another segment coming up next. We got a couple more. Day three, this is kind of our slide out of Europe. A great successful show for theCUBE. I'm John Furrier, we'll be right back. <laughs>